Rich Swisher. So we connected on a Patreon tier three chat live on one of the Zoom calls, and we had a quick down and dirty discussion about everything from cryptocurrency to Bitcoin to blockchain technology, and the conversation got very interesting. And so um, I offered you a slot here, and, and I'm just really excited that you're here because I am very interested in this subject, and it seems like no matter how many things I watch, I just wind up more confused. And uh, you had you were explaining things at a level that even I can, that even I can understand. So uh, I just want to say thank you for coming. Oh man, my pleasure. It's an honor to honor to be on here. Love your show. Um, love to see veterans' voices uh, being heard. Like to see so many of the initiatives and the nature of these guys' initiatives. So I was just as a fan of what you were promoting and showcasing on here. Um, and uh, we as a veteran owned business, we're, of course, you know, we see ourselves in that. So super excited. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for letting me come on. Oh, my pleasure. Well, let's get into it. So <clears throat> you had studied some of this blockchain, Bitcoin stuff, uh, crypto in, in one capacity or another at MIT. And uh, so that's what makes you relevant on the subject. And so I just have so many questions, but let's just dive right into blockchain, blockchain technology. It seems like that blockchain technology is coming up more and more and more in tech news. And a lot of people are saying this is going to wind up being the new internet and the new everything. So can you kind of guide us through what exactly blockchain technology is? Yes and no. If I guide you through exactly what it is, we will all end up glazed over like, like happens so much. I think really simplifying it for somebody, for somebody who scanned the horizon going, just like you're saying, all right, there's winds of change. I've, hear, I've heard it too many times from too many different levels of, you know, of uh, global interaction down to day-to-day -day interaction that something is changing. And if you try to dive in on the, te a technical person will dive in, they, they get it really quick. It's not that it's tricky, but um, let me give it first, let me just give kind of the very basic of what swap we're looking at doing. Because what we're doing is we're swapping the old programming that the internet was written on for a different programming. They wrote code differently. It's been a long time. Codes come up with a much smarter way and there's a big fundamental change in the way the, the what we're used to operating on in a, on a computer um, in, in the old format, the old HTTPS internet and whatnot, you go on and you look at something and you see it and you're seeing what a lot of other people are seeing. You're seeing that window on that website and it's you can pick which page on it to go to and do all that and kind of see that. And when, when you take something from it, um, you can take copies of things from it. You can take photos of it, you can take videos of it, but you don't change its property whatsoever. It stays there. It hasn't altered or changed. With blockchain, you're still going to be able to go and see a website. You're still going to be able to go and um, interact with it. Um, you could even take a copy of something from it. Or you and that website can agree that they can give you something that now they no longer have and you have. That's the essential key difference. Okay. Now things can move. That's 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 one of the big differences. Like, what would that thing be? Just as an example. Um. That man, there was one recently that I thought that would be a that would be a cool one. I mean, it, it would be an NFT, or or some money, or any kind of item that you can digitalize. So, an NFT records. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it can, it can any any document, anything like that. Documents are quite often it's okay to copy, but if you need the original um, digital form, then you have it. I don't completely understand and agree with NFTs. I have friends that are artists, and like I I like to have their art, but I'm going to display it on their wall. But let's say I've got a digital wall to display it on, um, and I know I have one of one. No one else has the digital. Well, I also know somebody has the original somewhere. I wanted the original. 
Other people say, no, the digital is enough for me and I'm collecting them here and I know that no one else can have this exact digital thing. Um, when it comes to those levels of NFTs, I don't think it has a massive effect on society and on, on buying, collecting digital kittens and all this kind of stuff. I don't think that's going anywhere. But the fact that they solved the double spend problem, because they've been trying to do digital money. I mean, everything you do with your money is digital or, you know, the vast majority of it all already anyway. It's just accounting for it. Yeah. Um, I gave my credit card at the restaurant and they, um, they accessed it through its PIN number, its unique account, verified my identity, and they sent a request through to have money sent. Well, three days later, probably, that restaurant, that all of those, those chains of transactions are happening, where digitally, with what I'm talking about with a blockchain, it's instant and it's real. So this is, this is essentially a faster, more efficient internet? Is that what you're saying? And it does something that you couldn't do before. Before it was only copies. Okay. Now it eliminates that thing in yours and puts it in theirs. Okay. That's that's the big key. The other big key, and and really, if you wanted to title um, this show anything other than like Bitcoin and Bitcoin's blockchain, it would be decentralization. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because one of the things that really got me interested. I was never interested in cryptocurrency or anything until until COVID. And then with COVID came, you know, a lot of fear with everything. And I started, that's when I really started paying more attention. And, and as the government continuously gets involved and gets their hands in more and more things, I, I don't like that. And so when I hear decentralized internet, decentralized finance, to me that meant that this was almost like a shelter where the government couldn't get their dirty little hands into my money, you know, or maybe it might help with things like censorship or not one person controls the entire internet like Facebook, Amazon, you know, Google, you know, they control, I mean, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but they control, they pretty much control the internet. And with, the way I understood it was with the decentralized internet, decentralized finance, that it's it's basically the 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 populace. It's not controlled by any one person. Is that true? Yeah. Let me let me alter a couple words. Not controllable by anyone. It's not controllable by anybody. Yeah. It, it, not even that it's not because. A lot of people talk about Web 1, Web 2, Web 3. Mm -hmm. They call them blockchain Web 3. Web 1 was basically got the internet up. You and I or you and a hundred other people can connect, like, you know, digitally. We can share things. We can look over at sites and whatnot. And it was, it was very decentralized. It was centrally controllable, though. Just, there hadn't been the big financial incentive figured out yet or whatnot. The dot-coms come rushing. Everyone is looking to centralize it. Um, everyone's like, we're looking at it with electronic vehicles right now. Um, I, I forget the number, but like at the turn of the 20th century, it was like 300 car companies making cars in 1900. You know, where the heck are they now? We know like 10. Um, well, that's what happened. And by like the 20s or 30s, there was only like 10. They centralized. A lot of the, the shaft falls away. You merge, you combine, you team up, you whatever. And that's kind of what happened with the internet was they're like, wow, this is really about, hey, now that we can do this, we can also, and we can also, and you started forming companies out of it. Things started teaming up. Um, you started going to the really familiar site and pretty soon we centralized it. We did and the Silicon Valley companies and all them, we centralized the internet. And now, you know, and it got to the point where you say they, they control the internet, man, and what all does the internet control? Everything. That's, that's the big scary thing. Um, and so you look at, you look at their philosophies and sometimes, um, and I don't mean to call out any of the individuals, you know, by name that, that run these companies, but I'll see them on podcasts and whatnot and are almost like philosophers. And they're really going over, okay, well, how should we responsibil responsibly guide society based on my morals. I mean, 
that's that's what you're talking about and what I'm talking about when we say like, yeah, time out. I don't need you deciding that for me. I am somebody who likes self-determination um, to, to a fault. I'll go ahead and fall on my face. Just let me pick it. Let me pick how. Let me let me do my thing. Um, the way the way that my whole company motive started was we had this opportunity. We were we we, we were fortunate enough. We were solving a five percent mortality problem, just little village by village. I mean, we started out with a hundred kids, um, but that's five lives saved. That so that was big in our book. Side deal. Um, we get Bitcoin in and it starts opening up so much more of what we can do and how we can do it. Um, the way money is sent, the way it's received, the way you pay everything digitally, it's, it's just really, um, really simple. And there's nobody that can pull the rug out from under the people that we're helping. Well, okay. Before we get, we'll cover your nonprofit and company uh, in the latter portion of this. But when it comes to decentralization, the way I understood it was, you know, it can be this guy has a mining machine in his closet. And this company has twenty mining machines, and this, and it's all these mining machines that are kind of working together to solve these complex math problems, which make the blockchain work. Correct. So my question is. Right now it's decentralized, but you're seeing these massive mining operations, these massive Bitcoin mining operations showing up in warehouses where they have tens of thousands of machines. And so what happens when one of these tech giants, you know, who can't afford a million mining machines, puts those all into one warehouse, wouldn't that be kind of centralized so let me make sure you're clear on what decentralizes it so it's the, let's use the bitcoin blockchain it's one ledger okay there's one ledger around the whole world it's carried on millions of nodes what you're talking about mining nodes computers it's carried on millions of computers and run and it's checked and it's simultaneously updated on all of them um, it's not located in one place where we can go and do a strategic strike and knock it out. Ah, we killed Bitcoin. No. It, and we can't even hack it. Like at a bank, you can go in and hack a bank. Mm -hmm. um, they use really old technology, really old mainframes. Um, they've got a bunch of protections in place. But if you go there and you change that ledger, you change the ledger. So it's, it's done. If you go in to that giant facility that's two square miles of nothing but machines running. And you create some kind of great new technology to where you can, you can type across all of them at the exact same time. You're in and you can make things happen. You have nowhere close to what you need to try to edit a record on the Bitcoin blockchain without authorization. Because millions of computers around the world doing that. Okay. And as those algorithms would go in, the ones you tried to fudge would pop up going, this math doesn't work. Okay. Even if you were so brilliant to make those maths work, if any of those went to any of the other computers, they would go, it doesn't work. So it is, it is a trustless system. And it's called trustless, which means it's trustworthy. And what you're trusting is that constitution that it's written on. And that constitution that's written on is is based on some super complex math. And that, that keeps us, keeps it decentralized, keeps it safe. And with Bitcoin, and, and I don't believe I'm wrong on this, I heard somebody else say it differently the other day, and I, I think they were wrong, but uh, you need a 90% of all of the computers around the world that are running the Bitcoin node to make a change from the Bitcoin core development team, they put forward, propose a change report. It takes 90% of them going, yeah, before it goes. So China, this last year, I think it was 2021, completely you know, pulled out a big, ah, Bitcoin's illegal, don't use it, don't do anything. China's realized they can't. 
So they it, can't beat it. That, that brings up another question because I I remember when they did that last year. I believe it was last year. Um, a lot time. of people thought that it was the crypto as a whole was going to crash because China had pulled out. Now, so when they made that illegal, does that were they able to shelter their citizens? their population from actually using the exchanges like Coinbase, Binance. Yeah. And so if they were, how were they able to access their money? So exchanges are, they, they have both a uh, Bitcoin wallet and they are a bank. They have, they have everything a bank has. Okay. Um, so everything's, Visible on there, everyone is identified on there. It is centralized, not decentralized. Um, it's the other side. It's not. It's it's not on the blockchain. Okay. So that's that's an exchange. That's where you go to cash out your money, cash out your crypto. Um, there'd be no other reason I would know of that it would be smart at all to ever hold money on an exchange. The only reason you would do it is for FDIC assurances. And I trust my own security well enough to not do that. Um, so I, I, that's. So and then where would you put your money? I would put, well, I'd have some in a hot wallet, which just means one that I use that has a small amount on it. Like you put your fold money in your, you know, your wallet as you go out like, ah, I should have 60 bucks or whatever. I may keep a few hundred that's there. Almost like what you keep on a credit card. That's okay. your credit card. Use that to spend around. Here in the U.S., we don't have to do that much. Down in the third world where I'm doing microeconomies, that is your credit card. That's your bank, your everything. Um, so they have an actual have a phone app. crypto credit card? No. Or it goes in your phone? They're, they're working on credit cards, but then again, it, it gets tied to banks. Mm -hmm. um, so no, the people that down in Peru and throughout South America and, and everywhere else, it's not us, but other people doing it. It's just... It's on your phone. You bring up your app, um, and it's it's a it's a decentralized app. It sits on the blockchain. You access it through your app store, just like using any other app. Has real basics on there, and you can send, transact, you can trade currencies in in some of the wallets. You could trade one cryptocurrency for another cryptocurrency if you wanted or whatever. Um, but if you're talking about like your where you're going to store your wealth. You would want to use a hardware wallet, zip drive. Um, they make them special for this that you can enter information into. So it has no Bluetooth, no internet connectivity. It has to be plugged in. You unplug it when you're done, and that's your vault. And I had some, uh, I had some big um, financiers that 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 fund giant insurance funds and major development projects and all. And they came and they said, hey, how do we, when we are collateralizing a billion dollar loan and we have to collateralize it in gold, it's costly for us to collateralize it in gold and to have that much gold set aside, stored in reserve and whatnot. Could we do it in Bitcoin and what would it take logistically? Well, I know physical security and it's, a thing this big. How well can you hide it? There's a million ways to do it. Pick how you want. I won't say how I did mine, but um, that's where it goes. So that can't be touched by anyone. But even hacking into my wallet, just a simple wallet, whatever one you get online, if you get a good one. Um, can you give us some examples of like what a good app would be to put? Yeah, my favorite one just got purchased by Coinbase, but my favorite one was BRD, just a real simple interface. Um, my wife likes one uh, called Blue Wallet, um, and it's nice because I can you can set different different categories in it, so you can put money into different pouches. Um, easier for her to organize her money that way. Um, the one that we use, um, Bitcoin Beach Wallet, is really one of the best functional wallets, and it is on chain as well as on the Lightning Network. I, don't, I won't explain that right now, it's pretty simple. It's, it's just so you can do instant transactions. Okay. Um, and uh, they have a map of all the places in El Salvador and in Peru that accept Bitcoin. So if you're looking to pay with that, uh, you can go there. Um, 
what are some other ones? Strike um, is is a is a good hot wallet to use, um, but it really comes down to personal preference. I mean, I like I'm a non technical guy. I like things real simple, straightforward. I mean, I, you don't worry about. I mean, when you say you put it on a thumb drive, you're putting your life savings on a thumb drive. What if I mean? Are they fireproof? What if you put it in a safe and it melts? Yeah, those are the things you got to think about. Is, I mean, what if you put my, you know, my first thought was, I'll put it in the bank in the safety deposit box. Yeah. Which really defeats the purpose. Yeah. They can lock me right out of there. Um, the, uh, not that that's the only purpose, but yeah, that, that does defeat one of the purposes. No, it comes down to, um, you know, you hear about the people hiding their money in their dresser or hiding their money in their mattress or. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to be honest, I have two different of those thumb drive wallets. I think one is a Tether. Tether, does that sound? Tether, tether. or Trezor? Trezor. That's... And then there's another one, which was the most popular one. I can't remember. The... I really like Trezor. That's what but I, I, when I, I got to be honest, I didn't put anything on there. Because it's freaky. <laughs> I, it's an electronic device that lights up, and I'm like, man, what if this electronic device malfunctions and, yeah and do you know what i mean so that i mean is there any have any of these malfunctioned before yeah i had a ipod way back in the early 2000s i have an ipod i go to a hotel room i've got all kinds of my my business partner had pumped a whole bunch of his music into it somehow mm -hmm. and i had my library so i like the super library and i plugged it into the clock radio in the hotel room and it deleted everything on that yeah, that's what I thought of when I went to put a group of money onto yeah. a zip drive. It was like, are there any this reports thing, that happening? If this screws up, so here's here's what you have. Um, you have codes, and if you have a Trezor, you have your your um, your personal key. Um, that to to be a little bit technical, just to show off. Um, there's personal keys and there's pro and, and there's um, or there's private keys and then your public keys. If I send you um, some money, our public keys are going to interact. That's how your wallet's going to know. Ah, it's coming from that wallet. It'd be my identifier. My private keys has to do with my encryption. You'll never have access to that. I'll never have access to yours. And your recovery, you know, when you when you go in and you download a good non KYC wallet, which is also really important for your readers always, or watchers always, use a non-KYC wallet as your primary, uh, which, which means your, your personal identifiers aren't on there. Um, when you go to open that account, they're going to give you this long string of words. And you need to write them all down um, and in the order that they're in. And let's say you, you put your, you go to put a million bucks into your zip drive. And it does what my clock radio did in Seattle all those years ago. And uh, you still have it. It's still on the blockchain. It's not sitting in that little plastic thing. That's just the key. Mm -hmm. That's the act. It's literally just the key to it's, access. It's where your account access is. Okay. And now you're spinning up a new one. So it would be like, well, I kept my money in my mattress. And my mattress just disappeared it's okay go buy another mattress bring it down here and put these codes in and it'll fill it with the money okay so you can lose the device it can burn up as long as you have those codes as long as you can get back into those codes you're good okay now i don't know every device out there and man correct me if i'm wrong on that but that's how you lose any of your wallets and you have that code you 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 have your personal key you have to go back in and the other thing, that's how you hear about, you know, we've heard our government saying like, oh yeah, we were able to hack in and, and get this much Bitcoin back. The only way they could hack, with all the power of the U.S. government, the only way they could hack in and get Bitcoin back is if they hacked into your stuff and you put those, you codes, put those on the codes somewhere. So that couple that just got nailed, who had scammed tons of millions and millions um, and they had, and they were super technical and they had hidden things all around. What's reported is at some place, at some point, um, they had encrypted their codes and they had put it, um, online. 
uh, never, ever, ever punched mine in anywhere, and I never would, and I would encourage anyone to not do that. Um, you can even further encrypt them in your own head or in other codes, other places, if you think you need to, but never share them and never put it on anything digital. Because when you think about scammers and, and hackers around the world, if you think they are not trolling right now looking for any list that has like 12 to 16 words on it, that could be a Bitcoin wallet. Okay. So, yeah, hackers are perusing through things. Whoa, here's a list of this many words. Let's see. Let's see what we can dig up and find. So, just never, never put them anywhere like that. Wow, that's good to know. Damn. <clears throat> kind of back, sorry, kind of back to the blockchain stuff when we were talking about you're taking one thing from this stack, putting it in this stack. I think when a lot of a lot of people don't realize as well, you know, everything's pretty instantaneous, but it's not. So let's say when you buy a home, and for those of us that are homeowners and, and close to house, we know exactly what we're talking about, where they wire the money. Good example. And you're just sitting there for hours. Maybe closing was delayed a day because the wire's taking so long. And nobody really knows where that money is from, let's just say, J.P. Morgan. It's going from J.P. Morgan Chase to the to the title company, and it's taken 12 hours. And it's in my mind, it's well, where is the money? It's in the like, where is the money? This should be instantaneous, but we're sitting there for 12 hours, and then you hear the horror stories: the money's been intercepted, or or the money's gone. I mean, I don't know anybody that's happened to it, but I've read about it in, in uh, news articles. So this basically eliminates the money wire. Whatever that is, whoever's making money along that chain of events, wherever that money's going in that wire from point A to point B, this totally eliminates all of that, right? It literally is instantaneous. Yeah, and it literally eliminates a lot of that whole intermediary process in buying a home. Yeah, that, that's an industry, the, the lending industry, well, the banking industry, of course, but, but, but the lending and the mortgage industry, blockchain is going to completely destroy it. It's not, it's not going to look anything the same. Is it going to become obsolete? Um, it's going to take, you know, where it used to have, you have 15 different procedures and people doing this and that and all that time, that's gone. It's just going to be, it's going to be um, instant. There are still, I, and I don't know the whole biz, so I couldn't go through and tell you what all it'll eliminate. But all that waiting and all, anything transaction um, related is is going to be gone. But so many of the other, anytime you look at an industry that's full of people trying to expand that intermediary's role to capture more and more and more, um, those are going away. That's that why I say again. It goes back to the decentralization. It's taken the power out of that that mortgage, that lender. Like, oh, well, you're already in the process with me. You know, you're you're in that process with somebody, and you're going like, this person screwed it up. I'm over it. But you're already in this big laborious. You're not going to mess with that on your house. Where if it wasn't so laborious, if it wasn't so convoluted, you'd be able to go like, a, I don't think I need anyone helping with that, or b, like. I can swap away from you really quick, so why don't why don't you just uh, straighten up and fly right? Um, the as far as where the money goes, I think a better question. And and you said people don't know where the money goes. I don't think people know what the money is. Um, that was one thing that you know what what is money? What's currency? Um, it's just a representation of value. It's anything. It could be this shoe, and I say this one. It's 50 bucks. Do we agree on that? Okay. Well, now we could go and we could make trades or something based on this 50 bucks. Yeah. That's what money is. What is a U.S. dollar? Um, a U.S. dollar is um, an individually printed thing with a serial number. Um, it has specific data on it that says where it was made, how much it's worth, all that kind of stuff. Um, Bitcoin transactions have the exact same thing. And they're, in, they're in a hash. Um, and they say, well, there's no paper to hold on to. Like, yeah. Awesome. Carry your paper around. But aside from wiping your nose in a few other places, what, what are you needing the paper for? 
well, I want to know the values there. Or I can destroy your dollar, but you can't destroy my Bitcoin. Mm. Um, the the big value is the U.S. dollar is it's the world reserve currency. Um, that's that's a superpower that it has. Um, but going back to the mortgage thing in this transaction, so we're talking about moving money around. You're talking about different or, different financial institutions having to say, okay, yes, this much of our pile is going to go over to that pile and this much goes here. And you have this old architecture for that, um, in, uh, IT wise, um, written on, on old, old programs. And you are still talking about moving, um, physical dollars that these digital dollars represent in many cases. And it's a logistics nightmare when all of that can be handled by, okay, here, I've got Bitcoin. How much is the house? It's, it's a million. Okay, send me a request, and I'll send you a million dollars. And when it goes, because it's a large amount, that transaction is going to happen in the next 10 minutes. Miners will pick up on that one early. They'll get better fees on that. So they'll pick up on that one early, and I will probably send you a million dollars for about a dollar, and it'll hit within 10 minutes. Wow. If I do the Lightning Network, uh, it'll be instant. Instantaneous. Instant. And it, it, the Lightning Network is, it's called a side chain. It's kind of like when you go to the grocery store and you write a check mm. and you hand them the check and you get the groceries and they know that check's going to cash. The Lightning Network does kind of the same thing. It just waits until it's the most optimum time on the blockchain to put it into a block. So okay. if it's a $5 transaction, you might wait until the middle of the night when nobody's on the network. It's a million bucks, let's get it going. But um, anyway, that would be how the money would move from me to you. We could both sit there and watch it, and it could be fine. The, the I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people I hear, especially with this audience, which this audience is changing rapidly because the content's changing, but a lot of people in this audience are kind of the old school mindset, and I'm, I'm not, I'm about halfway. You know, I'm in the boat. but with the with the old school mindset of oh well, well if the power grid goes down, you don't have any money, or you know I can't touch it. It's not real with the gold. Like Peter Schiff is a big, he hates Bitcoin, yeah. but um, but um, but most. But we had this conversation a little bit earlier. Most of the transactions you're doing every single day are almost it's a digital currency already because it's all credit cards, it's all debit cards, it's all checks, it's all, actually I don't even know anybody that uses checks anymore other than me. But, yeah, but, you, get, um, you get out of the line behind those people in the grocery yeah, store. Yeah, Venmo, oh, checkbook. Venmo um, and, and when you do go to the bank, and this also happened to me uh, during COVID and it just happened to a good friend of mine and recently, you go to the bank and you wanna get some money out, you, a lot of times the bank can't even cash the check. And these aren't like some, you know, super substantial amount of money. I'm not talking like, I'm not even talking $50,000. You know, I'm talking maybe 10 grand, you know, just to have on hand, maybe five grand. And they're looking at you like, can't cash this. We don't have the money in, this, in, the, in the bank. And so basically what I'm getting at is your money is already damn near digital, all of it. And, and I don't, you know, I don't even think there's, so this is basically the same thing, but not controlled by the bank. We're not changing a whole lot of how money, the fact that money moves around digitally. I mean, what if it was just, what if you and I just did an agreement? What if we did a contract? We we're headed over, we we're headed over your wife, you, me, and my wife, we're headed over to uh, Germany, do some Oktoberfest vacationing. And I'm like, and, and it's kind of a two-company trip. And you go like, all right, well, it's an expensive trip. Why don't you pitch in 10 grand, pitch in 10 grand, cover the things we're doing. Now, we could, there's a ton of different ways we could do it. We could put, we could put money in escrow. We could have a third-party holder, whatever. Uh, we could transact it. I could just give you, hey, here's 10 grand. You handle it or whatnot. Or we could just do a contract and say, yeah, yeah, when I get there, uh, I'll have 10 grand to throw in. You too? Okay, cool. 
and we'll do it at noon on October 1st there. We're throwing the, throwing the money in. Cool. Um, we've just made an agreement on how we're going to go about doing that. That's 99% of it. And when we get there, we either live up to our agreement or we fall through. Um, and our, our contract was based on trust, but it was a legal contract. So if I show up there and you show up and you didn't have the money, I'll sue you. And I, I can come after that. There's, so there's a little more assurances. Um, when it comes to the power grid going down or um, the uh, people not having access to their money or not being able to put their money forward, none of that is changing by going to digital currency. And it doesn't have to get rid of everything else. It's probably going to work better than everything else. So most everything else will fall by the wayside. But it's not required to get rid of it all. I think the most important thing you brought up in there is when you go to the bank and they won't cash your check. No. Your check is an IOU from somebody saying they're giving that to you. Why can they say, no, we're not going to do that? They're a private company. They don't want to. That's why. Okay, great. Um, the government can also tell them they can't do that. The government can tell them, don't honor his IOU. And now you don't have that money anymore. It's, that's, that's been taken, uh, those, those rights have been you know, kind of removed from you. Now you can go and sue and try to go th through things. Or when you're, the government takes a look at you um, and comes in and just seizes and shuts everything down while they take a look. Well, the little guys get crushed like that. Yeah. Um, shoot, I mean, General Flynn, look at, the, look at how, how it damaged him. He's sitting there working in the White House when the government comes in with lawsuits and the FBI and everything, you're too small. Yeah. You can say you can fight, but you can't. Um, the, it's a different thing if they were to come. If the government is upset at me, and let's say I have a, a big pile or upset at my company or whatever, and they can come in and they can seize everything, including my body, and throw me into a cell. But I get to decide when I will give up my property and my digital property. Um, they don't get to do that. Same thing if I had a if I had a big pile, if I had a pallet of cash. If I have it in my house, I can do a search warrant and seize it. Uh, if I have it hidden somewhere, um, then you know maybe they can't. I can say I'm not going to tell you where it is until and I, I'm able to hold that as a little bit of hey, will give me some leverage. Um, digital assets allow that. If Bitcoin, I should say, allows that. The others, there's, there's a big, big, big difference. And you let me know when you want to get to it, but uh, Bitcoin is completely different in a real big fundamental way to every other asset that's considered a digital currency or digital um, money. Um, but I like the idea. I, I, I'm going to keep paying taxes. Um, don't love it, but I know that's, that's part of having this great country. Um, I'm going to keep following the rules the best I can follow the rules. Um, but I'm not going to give up advantage where I don't need to. And whenever I look for greater advantage, I'm going to take it. Well, there's greater advantage in money that can't just be taken away from me without me having anything to say about it. Maybe in five years, I'll win it back through court cases. Yeah. Um, I really, I really value that. I think there's very little downside to having the individuals control their money. I think the individuals should control their identity. I think individuals should control their medical records. There's certain things that are like, why was the government? Why is the government in charge of this? Why am not? Why why am I not in charge? Um, and and I think right now with what we have going on in Russia and Ukraine brings up an, a real interesting wrinkle in just that kind of thing with somebody who thinks like I do. Um, we, uh, I don't know where, where everyone stands on agreeing with our posture that we're taking in the Ukraine thing. Um, but what we're taking is we're holding back on military, just kind of putting that wall up on NATO, and we're hitting them financially. The main reason we can hit them financially, we can take a lot of their money or we can stop a lot of their money of a, of a whole nation with that SWIFT system. Um, and needing to be in the SWIFT system and being part of the global banking system is, you know, one of the things, one of the negative things people say about overreach of government control is, 
the bankers and the bank systems control everything. They do. Yeah. They really, really do. Yeah. Um, more so than the militaries of the world and everything, bankers run this world. Um, that's why we're able to do what we're have the kind of effect that we're having on Putin. It's why China holds back and goes, geez, geez, I don't know. It's why China wants their yen to become the world reserve currency. So there is somewhat of a benefit to having the ability to have that kind of control. Um, kind of got to weigh it out. Do you think that the, so this is obviously a, a huge threat to the banking system and I would think so. how are they going to, they're not going to conform to this and they do run everything. So how are they going to allow this to happen? Are you, are you telling me that they, the most powerful organizations in the world aren't going to find a way to control this? Yeah. They don't think they will. I don't think they will, which I'm excited to say. Yeah. Um, they will do what any good, smart business or entity would do faced with, hey, your industry, it's not going to work like it did before. There's this new force that's come in. Um, it's, it's digital uh, currency supported by and secured by cryptography. Uh, your old ways are no good. They're not just going to go like, oh, we'll just stay here till we're bankrupt. They're, yeah. they're rolling over into um, coins and currencies. And, and I think plenty of the vast majority of them are trying to find where their position is during a rapidly evolving technology session, right? So the, I believe that you're seeing a lot more right now, central bank digital currencies are the big thing, CBDCs. And if you take a look back, I explained to you, I spent a lot of time um, watching YouTube and reviewing things and whatnot, and you sort of get a feel for what's trending right now. What are the stories that people are really talking about? Right now I hear a ton about central bank um, digital currencies, CBDCs. Oh, CBDCs, this and that. Oh, we get the value of having a central bank. Um, I value a central bank as much as President Jackson valued a central bank. Um, there was a thought uh, by our forefathers that our forefathers that it was good. I think it was Madison really pushed it. It would be really important for us to have some debt. We need to have some debt so that it will spur industry. We need to have some debt so you know there'll be taxes. There'll be that drive, and that central bank started. And, and failed and started and then started again, I think, and failed. And then Jackson killed it and paid off all the debt. It's the only time our country's been debt-free. Paid off all the debt. And the banks tried to stage a financial crisis mm. to beat him and squashed it, paid off all the debt, and they couldn't. And Central Bank goes away again. Central Bank comes up later because... Um, and I'm, I'm getting too far off of your question there. I, I won't keep going down that channel. But central bank digital currencies are nothing more than your paper dollars that aren't paper anymore. That's the only difference. They're not in your wallet. <clears throat> well, I, so I kind of see your point. But I mean, we've already seen crypto markets manipulated, especially with Elon Musk and his tweets with, with a, a Dogecoin. Yeah. You know? Oh, and, he heard Bitcoin. And, and, it. and so I guess where I'm going with this is how many Bitcoins, there's only going to be, what, 21 billion, million, million Bitcoins ever mined, or is that right? Yep. And so what happens if the banks own 11, 51%, yeah, 51% of it, they can, they will be able to man, manipulate the market, correct? They would need, um, on most blockchains, you need 51%. Bitcoin, you need 90. So it ain't going to happen. But 50 is not going to happen. And that's the other thing. that it Part of what makes the Bitcoin blockchain so unique is, is, A, it was the one purposely devised because of how corrupt mm -hmm. banks and governments had been around the world that they damaged the whole world. And whoever this secretive individual or group was were like, enough of this crap. I am supercomputer tech person, and I will come up with 
a way through coding to get around this. And that's, that's where the Bitcoin blockchain was invented. Um, so it's slower and uses more energy because it's super focused. It's a, it's a, um, it's a proof of work um, verified blockchain. So it has to get that you send these mathematical problems out and they take all the energy doing that kind of stuff. So it's super secure. It has no one that owns Bitcoin. There is no group in charge. There's no decision maker. There's no one to arrest or seize, which is the most beautiful thing about it. Um, there is no way to shut it down. Uh, if you corrupted the entire group of um, core developers that rotate in and out, uh, working on the Bitcoin blockchain, you corrupted the entire group, still need all the computers around the world, all the Bitcoiners out there to agree with what they're doing to make it make effect. So it makes it, it makes it super, super locked and secured like that um, to where it's, it's not, it's, it's not going to be tampered and you can't have somebody truly manipulate it. Can you have somebody that has a lot of popularity say something that affects it? Yeah, like China did. And man, that took a ton of value. Man, that hurt. It hurt a lot of the people that I'm serving down in South America. So it pisses me off when that happens. Um, but then you watch it inch back up. And what I've seen after being down the rabbit hole in this, in um, the Bitcoin world, is don't panic. Just watch. The price you see doing these things is from all those people who really don't understand how incredibly stable it is. The price fluctuation going to happen. That is due to lack of understanding of what we're really looking at. Do you, how long do you think it's going to be before this becomes more mainstream? I mean, it is, and it is becoming mainstream. Walmart, is it Walmart accepting Bitcoin or they have Bitcoin ATMs? Shopify, which is the biggest website building platform in the world, I believe, now is accepting it. PayPal's accepting it. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's showing up all over the place. However, I think it's going to be hard for it to be a currency because of the because of volatility. That's so that's where I have real world good expertise is in creating these micro economies. So starting it from scratch and building it up. And in America, we, I can't build a Bitcoin micro, micro economy. We're first world. Uh, that works in the third world where they're needing spend. We're not looking for spend. We're looking for uh, wealth creation and storage. And so the way we, the, if you look at the U.S. as far as adoption goes, it should be last. And the fact that our currency happens to be the world reserve currency would really mean like we have it better than anyone else in the whole world. So look at the U.S. adoption as the final straw. Okay. And you're right, it is already happening. And I think more importantly in the U.S., the level that it's happening at is wealth storage. It's putting it on corporate books. Um, it's, it's investment. Um, it's replacing the gold standard. Um, the, it, it would be interesting. I'd love to have a talk with Peter Schiff. I'm sure he's infinitely smarter than me on this. Trying to but get him. I would love to say like, okay, you battle for the gold as the standard. And I'll battle for Bitcoin as the standard. And I just think even, even I could win that one. Um, the, what, what you see as far as adoption goes down in the third world and in Africa, one of the guys, one of the guys I worked with, this guy Asher Hopp, who's an army, army vet, really interesting, super cool, brilliant guy. Um, it, after, after his special ops medic, um, not special forces, special ops medic. Uh, and then he went to Harvard and then he went to Princeton. And he's like super brave. And um, he was um, he was working on um, this node, uh, a ruggedized node, Bitcoin node, to take down to um, Latin America. And his vision for it was he's going to hook it up to satellite and it will be a a bank system, an entire encased banking system for a community out there 
um, all of their spending, all of their loans, all of, all of everything running right through this little Pelican case. Um, that's the reality down in the third world. And then it's getting these people to transact with it. Um, it's, it's super easy to get them to transact with it. Just the right people have to accept it. So if you have people that have it to spend, retail places where they can buy things that they need, um, and the suppliers of those retail, and the last little piece is the producers, farmers, um, the, the ranchers or whatever. When you have those, it fills in an economy. That's what we're doing in Peru, and it's working. Yeah. That's what um, Hope House is doing in El Salvador, um, in El Zante with Bitcoin Beach. It's, it, the project's known better as Bitcoin Beach. Um, it's working there. And then what Asher had saw, the reason it sparked in getting out of the army and doing all this Harvard stuff was he was over in Africa and doing humanitarian missions. And he's like, they're on this crappy little snicker bar of a cell phone from a million years ago and transacting, transacting money like that. We in America can't do it. And, and, and I really had him explain a lot to me. And he's like, yeah, if I take, if I take, um, Gen 5 cellular over there, I can immediately stand up a whole thing. Why is it taking America all this time? Because we have to go through Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3, Gen 4, Gen 5. When you take a new great system that works really well and you put it on the most basic elemental of societies as the economy, it'll tell you really well whether it'll work well or not. And Bitcoin worked fantastically well. We also, one of the problems that we had was theft. Um, now, you can have your money stolen out of your pocket, but you really don't want your phone and your money stolen. And if, you, if you're operating all on Bitcoin, your phone is where your money is. So when your cell phone goes, it's gone. Well, um, Peru, uh, we, we've had tons of robberies. We were in bad areas there, of course. And uh, you just go get another phone. Bring up your wallet and your money's still there. They can't access it, as long as you had it pin protected. Yeah. Um, so it replacing um, the economy, it replacing how you transact um, is easier, not harder. It's almost harder to say, wait, let's try to keep the legacy system. Let's try to keep doing all this. And like for the, for, you know, for the gold standard and what money represents, that's one thing that's really important for everyone to know that there is no money except for some cryptocurrencies now that represent some actual held value. Some, like, we don't have the gold standard anymore. We didn't even have the gold standard for that long. People look at it like, we had this gold standard forever, and then in 71, Nixon, no. We had, we had left that gold standard long before Nixon finally said, okay, we can officially not pay attention to it anymore. Hmm. And we had only had it from, like... Actually, I didn't know that. Like, the late 1800s through 1930s? This is the golden era of the gold standard. Um, before that, no, it's, it's primarily it's fiat currency. You hear that term a lot. Fiat just means by, by decree. Okay. By decree, that $1 thing with Washington's face on it is worth 100 cents. Okay. Um, and that's how manipulable um, fiat currency is. There's a couple of cryptocurrencies that are trying like, okay, you buy this much, We'll have this much gold held for you. Um, another one, we'll, you buy this much, we have this much asset held for you. My thing is, the real value is the scarcity and the unchangeability of Bitcoin. It is just 21 million, whatever the number is, happens to be 20, but there's a set amount. Mm -hmm. We know exactly how much will be mined every day. We know the exact day. The last coin will be mine. Um, everything is known about it, and you can't change it. Like a constitution. Like, I mean, that, that's the greatest thing. If we followed presidents rather than our constitution, think of the turns our, countries, our country would have taken through yeah. the years. Um, it, no matter what you're following. If you follow that one rule, and nothing's really shown up bad about that, that one, one rule. So that's what causes me to have far more faith in the Bitcoin blockchain, then in gold. And people say, well, it's not tangible. You can't hold it and do it. And I'm like, 
okay, let's me and you go for a walk. And I'll walk with my Bitcoin and you walk with your gold. And we'll see who gets tired first and how many things you found to do with yours while we were out on that road. Because I'm probably going to find more people to transact with than you are. I'm probably going to get more of a fair deal than what you are. Um, I'm not going to have logistic problems. Anyone in your transaction network are going to have. Um, and mine can't be taken as easily as yours can be taken. Exactly. I can take mine with me a lot easier than you can take yours with me. What if you live in a place, um, I mean, so much of it, we talk about the government conspiracy things or the anti-government way. It's, it's philosophical. Let's drive this country in the right direction, right? Um, it's not that, hey, we think they're trying to take us over, or I don't think that anyway. Um, the, the fact that they can't alter that. Um, they can't come in and seize that. It's super easy to transact anywhere around the world means that if the government were thinking of something bad, they would think about, okay, well, let's seize this, let's close that, and then let's, let's lock these people here. And the people in that area would think, okay, I either need to fight here or I need to leave here. Try to leave with your gold, and I'll try to leave with my Bitcoin. Because I'm just going to do a real quick send to my buddy somewhere else. Or I'm just going to hide that thing or whatever it might be. I might take my device and destroy it. And no, I'll get another one there and put my codes back. And I'll just keep my codes on me. Um, and the only way I'm going to get there, and Bitcoin is going to be no value or lost all its value, is if that network has been shut off. For that network to shut off and, and be squashed, I don't know if a massive global EMP would erase all of it. I, I don't believe that it would. It's unerasable. Okay. I like it better as a security device. As I'm, if I'm going to go through and evaluate that, I like that better than heavy precious metal. I mean, I, I understand your thought process and I'm not necessarily di disagreeing, but I do also like actual tangible things that you can hold as well I, I, but I like diversification but I, th I think one of the major problems with Bitcoin right now is is the volatility when do you think the volatility is going to calm is it going to be after the 21 millionth Bitcoin is mined when is it going to be because it fluctuates a lot it was what 70 something thousand dollars eight months ago ish now it's it, it was in the 30s yeah about a month ago yeah so you lost a lot of money if you were if you were oh if you Bitcoin, bought then and you lost sold. a lot of money yeah. you know what i mean yeah. so my gold didn't lose a lot of money so when is the volatility going to calm down to where people can actually transact in it all right first i would say don't be afraid of volatility the up waves are awesome because some of us started at 7,000 and went to 70. Um, and others are good at figuring out when kind of the waves go, when to pull a bit, just let it sit, and then put it back in or whatnot. But like I said, the volatility is due to the lack of understanding of how it's going to change. The timeline on toning that volatility down um, is going to be commensurate with how long it takes for everyone to go, let me dive into this whole blockchain thing and distributed ledger thing and a decentralized finance system and see when I, I just really want to understand it. When everyone does that, volatility will go way, way, way down, but people aren't going to do that. So um, they are going to see more and more leaders and smart companies go like, okay, all right, we're in. What's going to slow it down is penny stocks. Hmm. Um, so, I, like I said before, Bitcoin is the only, um, only asset in this class that we're talking about that is not owned by anyone. You know, it has all these special properties, super majority to, to change things, all, all this. Um, the rest of the coins, I mean, you're in a good position. You could do a coin. 
you could do the, the Vigilance Elite coin and pump it up on the show and get other veteran um, shows to pump it up. Everybody you know, just get put, take some money, throw a bunch of money behind boosting the value of the Vigilance Elite coin, and then tell them what it's going to do. Tell them it's going to do some great, some great things. It's going to have some great properties. Boost the price up. Hold a ton of it. Change the rules because you own 51% of it and scoop all the money out and run. Mm. Now, a bunch of people got ripped off. Some people had the right timing. They go, oh, Vigilance Elite. And they bought a whole bunch of it and it went up 100 times in price and they sold a whole bunch. Most people lost money on it. Mm -hmm. um, Ethereum, the opposite end of the spectrum. That, that's a scam. That's a, a shit coin. Um, and the other end of the and spectrum of the non bitcoins would be Ethereum. Ethereum is a blockchain that is a great surface to build decentralized apps on. It's a great medium for building those on. Um, that's what Ethereum's focus has always been. It's the builder network. They do have a currency. It does have a coin. It's, a, it's, a, it's called tokenization of a company. Um, basically, it's like shares, okay. having shares in a company. Um, they weren't setting out to become the money or anything like that. They're, as far as I understand, um, they're really focused on the blockchain and building great decentralized apps and communications. Apps. And when we're talking about non-censorship of social media platforms and all that, you know, Ethereum, I think that's where my bet would be. So Ethereum never set out to be an actual currency. I don't believe that was their, that was his big purpose. Okay. No, but they're really valuable, but they're valuable in my opinion. They're valuable because their blockchain and their build has been valuable. Bitcoin's blockchain wasn't built for that reason. It was built to secure the living shit out of your money. Okay. And to make sure nobody, nobody can get at this. So it's just a different purpose. It's not that Ethereum isn't doing it as well or anything. It's a different reason for it. Now, would I buy stock in Ethereum? Uh, I, I personally put all of my, my own personal, not even my family, my wife won't let me put it, all, but my personal investments, I put that into Bitcoin. Um, when it was below 30. Um, the, the rest of the stuff, would I buy Apple stock? Yeah, probably. And I think we have Disney too. I mean, I'm not even a fan of Disney, but it pays dividends. There's good stocks. And Ethereum, if I was going to build if I was going to build, I am looking at building a dApp, and I do want to build it on the Bitcoin blockchain, but if I was just looking to build a cool game or social media platform, I'd be looking at Ethereum. That's, that's say, okay, fine. It's just not, it's not the money. It ain't going to be the gold standard. It doesn't have some of the absolutely necessary requirements in my book to become, all right, let's get away from the decree fiat currency thing mm -hmm. and get over to a decentralized finance where the individuals own and control their own money. So, I, back to the volatility, and with these third world countries, like you guys are down, your nonprofit's down in Peru, El Salvador has adopted it uh, as its primary currency. I know there's another coin, Cardano, that I think is working on becoming the currency to several different countries in Africa, if I'm not mistaken. But with the volatility of these, these cryptocurrencies, the price of everything fluctuates. I would think it would fluctuate tremendously every single day. So if I go and this can of Coca-Cola is, I don't even know how to say the currency, you know, 0 0.00000152 Bitcoin, then tomorrow it's, Point zero 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 two nine eight Bitcoin. I mean, how do you, yeah, how do you so, keep up with that with the volatility? As so, far as like actual tangible good. So, for the individual, it means things are a little cheaper today, things are a little more expensive today, or whatnot, and it goes back and forth like that. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about your month, your day to day expenses, your monthly expenses get tougher because you're like, oh crap, there's a once a month and I'm short. Or there's a once a month and I'm fat. Um, that's what it's been like for us all the way along. And we're, we're denominated in Bitcoin. 
Um, so we just built the buffer in for that. We were just like, yeah, yeah, we can, the, the value can dip and, and swoop like that. Um, so we give ourselves an extra buffer in what we decide our budgets are going to look like. Harder for a company to do that on a balance sheet over mm -hmm. a month or a year or whatnot than an individual. We've not run into it in the problems of the individuals. And um, the main reason why on the ground in the economy it doesn't hit so hard is the price went up and down for the merchant and the purchaser pretty much the same. Okay. So when it's 0 0.0012 today and it's 0 0.0020 tomorrow, it's the same for the store selling it as it was for the individual. So you kind of bump. So now that problem is not the guy buying the Coke. The problem is the business. So the business goes like, okay, well, it's 0 0.002. What about my supplier? Where is it at? Well, if you're having to buy it from them for way more, that's where, that's where it's more of a roadblock. All right. So if you get there and you're like, hey, I'm ready to reorder Cokes. Oh, 0 0.0050 now. Oh, well, I'm not doing it. And if you're a business that already promised those orders, now you're at a loss. So that is, that is tricky. It is doable even under the volatility that we've had. I think I'm willing to bet we have been in operation with Bitcoin through the most volatile period, especially up and down volatility that Bitcoin's had. And um, we were able to do. It's still working. We were able to go smooth through it. Um, the the key thing to know about the volatility for for your viewers is look at what these things really are. Um, what you were talking about, like, well, but this one, will, you know, Cardano has this, and we go over, and it scares me to death to think of like a shit coin, and Cardano is one of the best. I'll still put it in the category of shit coin. Going over to Africa and being a nation's currency, it's 100% manipulable. 100%. How in the world is that not scaring the crap out of people? I wouldn't do that. Yeah. Um, Bitcoin's the only one that doesn't fall in that category. It's the only one I would think a government could possibly consider saying good to go outside of just repeating what they're doing with the central banks. Kind of goes back to what you're saying before. This banking industry, what are they going to do? Become an exchange, become a become a coin, and jump in and be the central bank. The money, just like we have now, but with better computers. How long do you think it's going to be? I mean, before Miami, for example, Miami is Miami. The, I believe it's the mayor of Miami wanted to pay government employees, city employees. They wanted to have the option to pay them in Bitcoin, and I believe he wanted them to have the he wanted the the citizens of Miami to be able to pay their utility their city utilities in Bitcoin as well. I don't know if that actually did that actually happen. I don't I don't know. I know they were I know they were pushing for that, and there and there's several there's quite a few places around. There's a lot of states now that are states? putting legislation. Yeah, yeah. What states? Um, and I don't. I don't know them off the hand, but it, it's a number of it surprised me. I'm sure Wyoming's up there. Wyoming's like a big Bitcoin state, so is Florida. But there's there's a bunch of others. Okay. Um, it it really I, I just get especially going into this conversation. It feels like what people are following are like these flashy bells we're putting out here, yeah. and it's about hey, you can make some money here. You can make some money here. Meanwhile. I'm like completely rearranging lives. Yeah. And we're going, hey, look at this. There could be value. Well, no, let's look at what it's going to do to healthcare. It's going to dramatically change healthcare. Let's look at the industries. It's going to wipe out. So many people have the jobs that I could never do where they're there taking care of things, data entry, doing this kind of stuff. It could be a lot of that goes away. There should be a ton of that that goes away. There's a lot of really good paying intermediary positions that'll go away. And it's, it's going to be, it's going to be a fairly rapid transition as companies roll over to this. Um, but it's going to be way more transformable or transforming than anything else. Like when we went from, I mean, did you really notice when we went from, 
processing on mainframes to more cloud processing? No. So on the back end, that was huge, massive, and it gave so many more capabilities. Pretty seamless for the users, you know? And, and did we need to really know what they were doing? No, you kind of just have a concept. All right, instead of watching a screen as to what's going on in my computer, I'm watching a screen that's showing what's going on in this computer somewhere in the middle of Utah. Okay. Um, blockchain technology. Um, well, why don't I need to go to the mortgage company and have them go to this person, have them go to that person, and then we have this transaction? Well, because we can take care of it all right here. If you don't trust it, you can do the math, and then you will trust it, or you don't believe in math, and we're done. So you don't need any of that anymore. Who's going to pay to do all that? That's, that's where it's going. And right now, I think what you have is companies and industries sitting there going, we don't know how to do this. That's why I went to the MIT program I did. Um, it's, it's about applying, understanding the way that you can operate with computers now that you couldn't, you know, 14 years ago mm -hmm. um, because of blockchain technology. Bitcoin's a totally separate, amazing animal on top of it. It's a currency. It's a, it's a store of value that can't be taken away from you. That's cool. But now this in, in leveling, um, leveling the playing field by the democratization of, um, I mean, when we're talking about decentralizing finance, we're democratizing money. The people that are in my programs down in uh, our programs down in South America and all, um, it's, it's completely decentralized. Um, they... I forgot where I was going with that. They, they have they have access. Um, yeah, I forgot where I was going with. Well, no, no worries. I do. Let's get ready to take a break real quick, and then we'll cover your nonprofit. But I do think that it, the world is headed this way. I mean, I, I think without a doubt, even all the people that are saying this is a, I've heard this is a Ponzi scheme. There's no way this is happening. I do think. I think it's inevitable that it's going to happen. I mean, and if you look at what happened back in the what, early 90s when email and all that kind of stuff was happening, you know, people were saying the same thing. Oh, let me, look, you're telling me that I'm gonna get all my mail on, on a computer in an inbox. No way. Well, it happened, you know, and, and, and when you look at the fang companies and online shopping, you know, where Netflix came from, I mean, you're getting DVDs in the mail. Now there's people that don't even know what a DVD is. And so I think I think this is the next major, major overhaul that's happening on, on the internet and with currency. It is, it won't feel it won't feel as much. And I, I kind of remember what it was, but it's 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 about the democratization. It's about saying you you own your money now. Guess what? You didn't. Before you did. Yeah. Now you do. You do own your money now and you control it. And it's in the bank of you now. You can put it in another bank in there. It's not smart in all cases, is in some. Um, but same thing when it comes to information. Don't censor one political party. Don't slit, censor certain politicians. Don't censor certain ideologies. Um, I know I, I had a, a, in the liberal city, I, I look in, people were so upset about the angry tweets that were coming from our country. So worked up about it. Like, man, whether you like what he's saying or you don't like what he's saying, wouldn't you like to know what's on his mind? Mm. Um, let's, let's, let's open that wide up. Well, the, the problem is power always coalesces. It always, it always comes together. It always clumps up. And you need a democratized strength behind it of people who can have access to any information. So as social media apps and communications apps and everything move over onto blockchain, you're not going to have that central hub with all the servers it was running through being able to go, no, shut that down. We're controlling it here. We, we have our master finger. We control that. Decentralized, won't be able to do any of it. So there's good and bad, but I'd rather know. And I'd rather have the power in the people's hands because they screw it up, but they ultimately usually figure more of it out than what they screw up. Whereas if you put it in a lone individual's hands, um, you can see 
just massive, terrible decisions made by lone individuals and their, their yes people around them. Yeah. Well, thanks for the explanation. Let's let's uh, let's take a quick break, and then when we come back, we'll dig into your nonprofit. Sounds good. What's going on, Patreon? Join me on Vigilance Elite Patreon for a live video teleconference. All right, Rich. We're back. You have a phenomenal article that just came out in Bitcoin Magazine that I skimmed through the other day, and uh, I'll link that below. It's all about your nonprofit, so tell us about your nonprofit. Yeah, no, that's a really exciting thing. Um, I've always been, it's kind of funny, I've always been a jack of all trades and master of none, and always like the bridesmaid. It's funny. And the episodes that I see on your shows, all these guys that have gone under these great units talk about where they almost got screwed over by that Air Force recruiter, um, or their uh, that Alan Cooper's episode where he just kept, things just kept falling his way. My career sort of went that way, but it was always in the military and in the police department, it was always like, ooh, right next to that big thing happening, but actually you're going to be doing this all the way through. And the result of it was, I just got, I got a lot of different things I could do. So when I was... Um, Working my way out of law enforcement, uh, I started a sports management company and did athlete management around the world that brought me a bunch of connections, um, got me more comfortable doing business internationally and whatnot. And, and then I'm, I'm often in my working, uh, in my working mode and <clears throat> I really didn't feel the same. I had always wanted, I wanted to do a career in the military. I um, ended up with divorce and with child custody and all, it either stay in or you get out and stay close to the kids, and that's what I did. And um, the um, opportunity to do work that you really feel passionately about, it's much less. In the military, that's a great thing I always took for granted is that you're serving people. And I really enjoyed that, and I enjoyed that on LAPD. Um, I was there doing a good thing for somebody. And I was making money too, but I was there doing a good thing. When I went into the sports agency, I, initially I was helping these guys that were getting kind of messed over, and then in a few years I was babysitting young millionaires. And um, I'm, I'm working at a really cool company doing biochemistry stuff, and some friends of mine got a hold of me from this um, group that I volunteer with, this really cool ministry called uh, Strong Tower Ministries in Southern California. They're like, hey, we know this place that's hiring um, for somebody. It'd be a big pay cut for you, but you can go, you'd be at the bottom, but you go and serve people again. They knew how bad I wanted that. And I did. I went to this great company called Kids Around the World, and they do playgrounds. They plant playgrounds, and they um, serve uh, nutritious food, um, and they deliver the gospel around the world. And I go to work with them, and I'm down in Peru building a playground, and it's exciting. Um, I love, you know, I'm, I'm, at the time I'm 50 or, yeah, probably 50 or close to it, and I'm digging holes in the ground, planting a playground and trying to build this thing out, and, and I loved seeing the communities that it planted, I loved seeing that change, and it, it was, it was a great place to work, it, it certainly wasn't a forever place, but I'm down there building my first playground in this remote Andean village, and the, the guy I'm linked up with, I'm, I'm getting ready to go build a big playground down in Lima, and I got a whole bunch of Americans coming down there, and they're going to do a trip and, and build this thing. I'm just kind of leading the build. But this little one up in the Andes was like a side project. Um, it was like, hey, go up there with this one dude from Romania, um, and where they don't speak Spanish or anything, and build this playground. So I'm building this. My dude from Romania is this guy named Valley Popescu, who's now my co-founder. Um, and they called him Mr. Plan B, because he never follows what people tell him to do. Uh, you, you, if you got him working for you, trust that he's going to do his very best the way he knows how to do. And so it's frustrating sometimes. And he's there, and he's super sick with altitude, and he notices, and only because of that, because my head's trying to dig holes in boulders, he notices there's this little boy that's walking around 
this village of a hundred kids in this remote Andean scroll. Um, this kid is walking around ten or fifteen other kids, and they act like they can't even see him. He's five years old. Their age range between two and ten or twelve, and um, he knows he can see them, but he fully is aware that he's just an observer. He's not to interact. So strange. Valley's sick, and he's watching this, and he can't work. So he was he's like, "I see something. Let me go. Let me go work on this." So Valley's gone for a while, and he comes back, and he goes, "Hey, there's a problem here. This this little boy that I saw, his mother died at childbirth." His father's a raging alcoholic. Um, he lives in a little mud huddle on the edge of the village. He's got a little fire pit in there with a grate over it. He's got grass all over the floor, guinea pigs. And he is cutting the grass outside, feeding the guinea pigs. They are his warmth. They're his um, food and his toys and his friends. And the village completely shuns him. And I'm like, okay... Can you, we still have more time in the day, or can you find out why a village is shutting him? It's a, it's a village of 100 people. A remote village of 100 people. Villagers tend to take care of children, you know? Not, not treat them that way. Um, and, and the kid wanders into class, too. He sees humans his size go into this little schoolhouse classroom, so he wanders in there. The teacher ignores him. He doesn't have a place to sit. Everyone pretends like there is not a presence here, which is a jacked-up way for a little kid to be grown up, period, I mean, in so many ways. So, Valley goes to find out why, and the why was embarrassment. Um, the village said, um, and the village is also organized in, in kind of like a Christian, like there's a village president and all that, but it's sort of organized under this pastor that travels around. And even that, with that, they're not helping this kid. And um, so, they said that they lose four or five kids every year um, due to illnesses related to exposure to cold through their feet. And they were sure this kid was going to die. His name is Jonathan. Um, they were sure he was going to die. His mom's dead. The men in Peru typically, uh, it's not real common for them to step in the plate. And the dad is a complete alcoholic. Um, so they literally wrote the kid off. And just don't, just like the, the new guy thing in Vietnam, like don't talk to the new guy sort of thing. Like this kid's five now. So found out there's another girl there, and she had been interacting with us all the time. She's about eight years old, named Dom Amazing personality. She had been in the same but reversed situation. And she's had a really strong personality, I think, that helped overdo it. Um, so I was like, well, the group I work with, they'll, they'll certainly help. But this is simple. Get them some athletic hiking boots and some foot care education and, and maybe some medical visits because there's circulation problems from all the freezing and thawing. And um, Valley was like, well, if your group doesn't, my group will. This, that's an easy one. And it was outside of both of their scope. And so Valley and I just decided, well, we have to do this. So it was about three grand. And um, I found donors to donate the money. Valley found the athletic hiking boots to buy. Um, helpers, and he found um, uh, the foot medical, they call them podologists, like, uh, less than a nurse, but a foot medical specialist, and um, took care of it. No kids died that year. Wow. Um, and we were like, well, that's a pretty great thing to do with three grand. So um, we go back out. It's the summer of 2020, pandemic's in full swing, and down in Peru, churches are closed. Nonprofits are closed. Nobody's serving anybody. Everybody's watching their own. And one thing that I got to, one of the amazing things I got to learn about Valley, Mr. Plan B, Mr. Do What He Wants. Valley is a, uh, he's a, he's a missionary. I don't know if he's as much a pastor. He's trained to be a pastor. He's not in that role right now, but he's like, yeah, I do what God wants me to do. I'll work with your ministry, but I work for God. And Valley's going to do what he believes is absolutely right and what he believes God's leading him to do. Makes it an easy person for me to work with, with some frustration, but he, um, rather than closing, Valley's like, we need, to, we need to help people down here. Let's see what we can do. Um, I knew through a family friend that he told me about this um, 
way that I might be able to get Bitcoin to help what I'm doing down there if I can come up with a way to create a circular economy with it. I had no clue how to do that. Um, and nor did, nor did Valley, but Valley grew up in communist Romania where you had to learn how to hustle. You, everything was you know, black market related. So there's a lot of alternate ways to do things. Um, and while they were all shutting down, we opened up. And we got this donation that came in and we had, um, Valley was losing, he has thousands of people that he cares for in this ministry that he's working with called Surafulio. And um, he was having like five to 10, um, like four or five new orphans a week, five to 10 new widows or widowers a week. And it's just falling down. Peru got hit worse than any, any other nation in the world got hit with COVID. And um, when he is not shutting down, I guess he's getting some heat from, A, he's dodging governmental shutdowns. B, he's getting heat from um, churches and nonprofits going like, hey, uh, we're all closing down. We can't do anything right now. And Valley's like, what do you mean you can't? Who do you work for? God didn't tell me to shut this down. I'm rolling forward. There are more people in need now than ever. Aren't we in the business to serve need? And they're like, well, you know, I'm characterizing the, the main response. Valley's like, no, we're doing things. And we're going we're gonna to save people until we're prevented from it. If they come and shut us down, if they arrest us, it, then we stop. But until then, we're just going to go. And I love that about him. Um, and uh, they didn't shut that down. And so many of these other places, a lot of people that work with us now used to work at some of the other places and had the same idea that it's just about, let's get things done, just do things. Mm -hmm. And that's the name of our, our organization is called Motive, M-O-T-I-V. Um, it is about, uh, two definitions of motive are, one is cause mechanical action, make something happen. And the other one is the reason behind you're doing something. Um, we want to cause positive change to happen. Um, and the reason for it is because there's a bunch of disempowered people out there that don't deserve to be that way, that need to be educated, they need to be given opportunity, they don't need any handouts, they don't need to be lifted up, they need to be given something that they can have hope in. And like this five-year-old kid Jonathan had, none of that. He knows he can't, mom's gone. Certainly can't count on dad. In fact, I probably need to hide a lot from dad. I have no idea what's coming next. And still, that kid was walking into school. Well, what, what should I do? He was looking for something to do. He's down at that playground looking for, okay, how do I go about doing this? There's nothing in that kid's life tells him he should be thinking about any of this shit. He's just lucky if he stays alive. He's looking for ways to make things happen. That's the kind of people we're looking for. That's the kind of people I loved working with in the military and, and on the police department. And the better unit you get into, the more you get around people that are just like, hey, you know, they're just uh, balls of energy making things happen. That's what we wanted to be. So we started looking at how do we help in, in the bigger cities. In the villages, we got the shoot thing. That's one side, saving the kids' lives. They have, bigger pro they have more problems there. I shouldn't say bigger. Um, in the cities, it was, they were starving, literally. Mm -hmm. So we were going, we were going and finding where there was food, talking those places into, hey, if you'll accept Bitcoin for payment, we got a, we're a big customer, we got a bunch of people who will buy. So we would set up trainings, socially distanced trainings, so all these people spread out, um, learning about how to use Bitcoin. What year is this? Last year. 2021? Well, this was, um, so we started doing this in late... 2020? Late 2020. Okay. Uh, like, December, November, we had our first event like this where we're doing this in the food, okay. getting the basic baskets. And what it was, was a family could come there, learn how to do this, learn what it is, and they can buy a week's worth of good nutrition. And nutrition is another big problem down there. If yeah. your kid, if the stomach's full, you're nourished in the in a lot of their minds, and we have to work on that. Um, the, we started realizing that, okay, once they're fed, there's still more they have to do. So we started looking at 
uh, we started putting together courses in vocational uh, training, um, which then we realized pretty quickly that they don't, they're not necessarily going to go work for another company. So we'll have some of that vocational training, but then we also need entrepreneurial training because in places like that, you learn how to scrabble for yourself. Mm -hmm. and that might be a vegetable cart, it might be a fruit cart, it might be a whatever. Um, so we have a lot of people going through. We've put I think, around a thousand people through that training this last year. Um, then we have, so we have a, a, a slew of these training programs and they can be seen at uh, www.motiv.ngo. Please go there. Um, the, the programs are designed to first um, educate them in whatever it might be. It might be nutrition, it might be finance, it might be vocation. And then um, equip them. So give them what they need to be doing that. Don't teach somebody how to ride a motorcycle and go like, all right, here's your car. Equip them, give them what they need. So whether it be uh, some seed money for that vegetable cart or um, uh, you know, maybe it's a tool, uh, maybe it's a, a, a phone, a laptop, um, but usually it's, it's, uh, it's more on the education side. And then you empower them. And that, that's, that's really some of the heaviest lifting we have. And empowering is just turning a switch in your mind. Empowering is going like, wait, I can do that. And some people, that switch is really stuck. So I got a couple questions. So you're going in there and you give them the goods and everything, and you get these stores to, these are essentially, as you stated earlier at breakfast, these are people that have been locked out. They don't have access to banking. There's no banks down there. There's none of that. So they've been, they've been locked out of the banking system. So you go down there, you're giving them shoes, education, food, all that kind of stuff. Are you actually funding all of these Bitcoin accounts for this, these individuals? How are they getting the Bitcoin? Well, they are, it's turning circular now within that. So yeah, it has moved up the chain to the suppliers to some of the producers. So we're kind of at, I mean, we officially formed May 21. I guess what I'm asking though, is it sounds like what you're doing is setting up an entire economy, like a mini economy. So they obviously did not have Bitcoin before your organization showed up. Yeah. So are you, as part of the education, you are teaching them how to utilize Bitcoin currency and then setting up accounts yeah. and funding these accounts. And now these, these mini economies are basically self-sufficient off, off of the education and the funding and the Bitcoin accounts that you've set up for them. They are, and they are headed toward completely self-sufficient. There are some that are completely self-sufficient and running. And there's others that are still, you know, there's, there are a bunch of them in various stages. And I think until we're not going to have the majority of them done and completely dialed until we get that, it's the producer class, it's the the big fishing boats, the farms, the you know the the, the big yeah. providers. Um, but but yeah. these people are trading in a currency that you've given them. Yeah. And so it is all. It's, yeah, it's going to take a minute, but it's all coming back. Yeah. Yeah, and, and because them, they don't leave these. You're talking about a small village up in the mountains where these people, they don't, they don't go to another village or they don't, you know, a lot of them haven't been to another village in their entire life and may not ever see another village. And so the, you're sustained, this is an economy that's sustainable for these people. Yeah, and so some of them are villages. Where we operate most is 11 million people. So in oh. the villages, the transaction circles are very different. And the culture is complete. The language is different. It's a different yeah. people altogether. So up in the Andes, you have the Quechua. So like in that village, Moye Moye was that uh, first village that had Jonathan in it. Um, you know, we provided those shoes. What we did there was not create a circular Bitcoin economy in that one village. We bought the shoes in Bitcoin. We paid the workers in Bitcoin. We've now trained people. So like the podologists, those are motive people now that are going through and being paid. So we're slowly having that economy take over. We even have a shoe manufacturing operation now. 
So okay. that's 100% done on Bitcoin. But everything is in a is in a percentage of done on Bitcoin. And like, you know, if you came and you got your vegetable cart built, you're not going to turn people away because they don't have Bitcoin. You take, you know, you take mm -hmm. whatever. They might trade a shoe for a papaya or whatever. Who knows? But yes, it's moving toward that. I think one of the most uh, poignant things about it is it was, it's nothing for an uneducated person to switch from. For them, it's soulless, but from mm -hmm. fiat currency to digital currency, it's easier. They don't have the fear. I understand that. They have more. They actually, Peru is the number one place for counterfeit money. And they are super hacker sensitive. That was a big challenge. No, this is hacker money. This is bad people money. No, actually, if you want to do crime, your best bet is to do it in US dollars or euros or something. But let me get, are you actually funding their accounts to get them started yes. with Bitcoin. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So that, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a no lose situation. We're going to give you money, but it's going to be in this currency and it's going to be more sustainable than what you're doing right now. Yeah. And I mean, and the people that we went to that with, not only were, Hey, we have a different system. We have a different system. Uh, your kids are going to be eating now. Mm -hmm. You're going to have, they're going to have clothes now. They're going to be able to go to school now up in that little Moyen Moyen. The other thing about the, the, the I didn't learn until this year, um, well, maybe late last year, was when your shoes wear out, which is not anywhere near the end of the school year, you're done going to school. Hmm. It's a 10 mile walk. Um, and kids die over exposure. You don't need, you don't need no. math or reading or writing. No, we, you need, need you to stay alive. So your shoes aren't good enough, don't go to school. And that was the only reason, that was the biggest reason of the, lack of education up there. Up in the villages, they're actually fairly educated. They're just geographically isolated from the broader economy. Um, they live in what it looks like, and this will, it'll tie back into um, how well this uh, digital currency works. In our case, it's Bitcoin. But um, the villages there, the Andes are really tall. It's steep cliffs down to a little village. There's a water source, and they do all their farming of their grass and their maize and everything up on these giant hills, and they live down here. Um, they, um, they could grow a lot of crops, but they're going to get screwed over when they try to deal with mm -hmm. outside entities yeah. and they don't have any way, they don't have vehicles. They don't have the kind of money to have a vehicle to get crops anywhere to invest in or whatnot. So they're really geographically isolated and the roads getting to them is, is, is tough at times of the year, bad weather and whatnot in Bitcoin. Um, and on the Bitcoin network and using decentralized apps, we can link all these villages up communication wise. And they're already linking up and training on a lot of the stuff we're teaching. We're reteaching them their ancestral crafts hmm. and they're making those and selling them. And then we're linking them with Cusco and with Lima. And now those crafts are being sold there. And these women who had no way to earn money before and their crafts, they were being lost on, on the generations. We've now got them teaching them how to redo that. We're connecting them to businesses in Cusco that'll sell the stuff. These ladies got so excited, these 20 ladies, they threatened to kill our guy if, if any of this was bullshit um, and, and meant it. Yeah. And, and they wear, wear the whole garb. It was wild. And it's funny, our guy, this Pastor Moses, he's Quechua. He called Valley and was like, we're sure this is right because they said they're going to kill me. Valley's like, yeah, we're good. Tell them we can do it. So we train them up on this, and, and Moses' wife trains them on the craft. And now they're putting up, ooh, I got a picture, I think I put it to that article. They're putting up sheets, they're going down somewhere in Sacred Valley, putting up sheets and setting up their own pop-up pop market and selling their wares. Could wow. never do any of this before. And now, could they have done that with Solas? Yeah, something that really sparked them to get them going. There's, there's several pieces that fell into that, but... Solus is the, the national currency in Peru, for those that don't know. Right. Um, but the excitement and the hope they got out of this new thing, Bitcoin, is just enthralling to them. So these women, these 20 women, and, and it's, it's, you, know, you always see that iron sharpening iron. They meant it when they threatened the life. They also mean it when they're like, we're running with this ball. This is awesome. We're going to go make big things happen. Um, they're teaching other women in other villages how to do those crafts. It's like spinning out of our organization entirely, which is exactly what we want. We want people to be motive. Make shit happen. Do it for the right reason. Go. Now. Do it. Quick. And um, 
So it's exciting watching that. Whereas in Lima, you really kind of, and we did it wrong early on. We didn't realize the hyper migrant um, situation that we have. They have tons of them, millions of Venezuelans in there, but people turned during the pandemic to daily, weekly migration. Like there's a place there I can earn 30 bucks. If I work for three days, I'm going. My whole family goes. And they're moving from shack and shed, and street camping to, to shack and shed and street camping. And so a lot of the people that we had in our program, we just had no way to track them. Then we dialed it in and we've got these 15 hubs. Um, and a lot of them are around Lima where, um, and Lima has like 42 different cities in it. Think of it more as like a big county. Um, they, uh, out of these hubs, like a community center, so your classes are out of there. Um, the kids' classes, kids' classes and childcare is a big piece of being able to make this happen because it's almost all single parenting. Um, the the stores that we reach out to to get them transacting in Bitcoin, we try to get a variety of them and have them geographically in these bubbles. And we started that reorganization late last summer. This hub. Um, I mean, like I said, we're a year, we're not even officially a year old, so wow. we're learning as we go. Um, but what we keep seeing, and we were also, the other thing was we were afraid of what the government there would think. Um, first interaction we had, we had a, we had a, a robbery with a bit of, it was like armed robbery with a little bit of a beat down and, um, called the police out to our, our, our hub, our, our first hub. And, uh, they were the police saw what we were doing. They're like, this is incredible. We're going to bring our chief out. Okay, so the deputy chief comes out. This is incredible. I'm going to bring the deputy mayor out. And we're like, okay, this is exactly what we were worried about. But deputy mayor comes out and he's like, this is amazing. We want to, we want to help you guys. Is there land you need? Is there, what can we do? Wow. So like, oh, okay. 100% on board. As, as 100% as, any, as the government can ever be. Yeah. So we were like, okay, no, take it with a grain of salt. We really don't need you or anything, but oh, we like being in you know, good graces. And as it keeps rolling now, we're directly working with the municipalities on um, consulting them on how to adopt um, Bitcoin and how to turn their cities into Bitcoin um, economies. So hey, we're, I'm really sitting at a transitional moment here. And, and, and as is Valley down there, um, where it is flipping toward the way El Salvador. So what El Salvador did is they made Bitcoin legal tender as well as the U.S. dollar is legal tender there, which just means if you go into a store and you want to use Bitcoin, they have to accept it. Okay. Bitcoin like is a currency, I think, in Australia and in Japan. It's not a legal tender. You can't make somebody accept it. Legal tender, you can. But the thing about El Salvador, it seems like the president there, everything happened so fast, they kind of top downed it. And at the bottom of the barrel, the people were either for the politician who said do Bitcoin or against the politician who said do Bitcoin. Oh, and sounds like this country. A little bit. <laughs> and so tons of them also had no idea what it was about. So what we are hoping that is in Peru, and, and now we're getting ready to branch into Panama and into Guatemala um, and Argentina, um, but um, we're hoping to educate that base layer, educate the democracy, edu educate the people that in our opinion, in my opinion, should be calling the shots, which are the masses, um, get them going on, let them make their own decisions. I don't think it will ever be something we all have to take. I don't think there's any way they're ever going to do that. Um, I think it will become the standard. Hmm. But it won't be something everybody has to do. And you can get around it. And I believe those there will be people kind of left out in the cold on it. that will jump in too late. But the, um, the other exciting thing is I'm at, uh, I randomly got bumped into by... A guy who's trying to do a landfill in Lima. And I was like, wow, I'm in Lima and I know about landfills. I, I came from a background, um, for, for a while anyway, in ind industrial biochemistry in the waste industry. And um, he was like, yeah, you know, any, you know any political figures down there? I'm like, actually, we know a few mayors. 
And we weren't a big help for him that way. Uh, this company, EOS, it's an energy developer. Think of like a land, a real estate developer, buys a bunch of land, decides what to do with it. They buy, rather than a tract to build homes on, they, they'll buy energy property and turn money off of those. So we get together with them and uh, like I said, I, I don't think they needed much of our help, but said we were helpful. And then as a nonprofit, for their social responsibility piece, a foreign company coming down there, it's a US-based company, EOS. Um, we're, we're the social responsibility piece. So when they build this landfill, which now I know it's gonna be, um, the plan is it'll be the largest waste to energy landfill built in the world um, up to that point. It'll be an incineration thing. Wow. Everything is going to be run in, in, the, um, in the organization's technical structure. It's going to be on, the, on Bitcoin's blockchain. Um, the trucks themselves are going to be censored up with weight sensors and geo trackers. And all the transactions of garbage going to here and there, managed by the blockchain, not by individuals. Interesting. And there's a good example of non-financial use of yeah. blockchain. So um, the problem they have right now, you know, one landfill, nine trash companies well trash company one gets paid to pick up the garbage they have to pay to dump the garbage hmm let me drive over to trash company three's neighborhood and dump my garbage on the ground it's free to dump there i already made my money picking it up hmm. in trash company three area they're angry but then there's a bunch of um, street pickers that are picking recyclables out of it and they've created their own sub economy earning money earning their in their way anyway off of picking garbage this landfill is going to ruin that because that incinerator in order for it to be profitable all the garbage got to go there so the trucks are they're censored so if we see that he's over in trash threes area dumping his garbage so he's fired um they're going to know to go to the dump they're also going to know how much dump is going in so how much fuel do we have going into that um, there will probably be other sensors telling what types of fuel are going in to monitor productivity on the waste to energy side. Um, the, uh, the, the, the pay and everything else like that, all the programs that we have, our educational programs, we're going to make those available to people, especially the trash pickers. So we're going to be trying to get them alternate careers, hopefully in, wow. in the waste industry, but, but wherever else. So let's just go and, and make it happen. And then now, as beautifully as that went, um, now we have a landfill in Panama that's leaking water into the waterway, and EOS has said the same thing, really cool company, um, and they're like, man, we love what you're doing. Let's find a way to have your programs do more stuff here in Panama. So looking at how to do that. Guatemala needs kind of a holistic overhaul of their whole waste management system. So we can dive in on that. I've, and I'm, I'm being more of the connection and motive is being the social responsibility piece where I hope we get to go and do great things. It, there's nothing like seeing uh, when, when, you, when you rescue somebody mm -hmm. and you see the look on their face of relief. It's amazing. When you rescue somebody's child, you see the look on their face. It can't, can't be touched. Interesting. And we see hundreds of those in person every day. And now we've had, we've directly, we tried to figure out how many people we've actively served in the short time we've been up. It's between 35 and 55,000 individuals that wow. we've served. Um, and it's really our belief, if we provide hope that you can look and see, there's, there's backup reasons for this hope. Mm -hmm. More people are going to start do, doing more things for themselves. Because charity, charity is a curse word. No. Handouts, handouts crush people. They ruin people. Charity is that's what I put in that definition. Maybe I'm wrong. What we want to do is empower people who've been disempowered. And like in the banking, there are banks down there. But you're going to spend, a, you're going to pay a couple hundred percent to have them store your money. Yeah. And the vast majority of the population down there, I've heard as high as 70, 75 percent, is not. They have no record of those humans. Wow. They're completely unidentified. So here's another area that I really, really want to go into, and I want to start taking a look at fundraising opportunities soon for, and really dive into some blockchain development, is why don't we get a universal ID that's owned by the individual 
not by Humana, not by the U.S. government, not by the state of Tennessee, but let you own your, your identity. So it's your personal filing cabinet. All of everything you have in there, and you completely secure it, and you completely control every bit of that information. That would be good for you. Your medical record is always updated no matter what doctor sees you, whatever. You don't have to do anything with it. They, they interact digitally through a blockchain. It would be real simple. But um, where I think it could become really helpful in, in an even broader way, first of all, it's, it's third world management. It's management of the largest pool of untapped resources we have, which would be third world, which first world so often looks at as a burden when it's... it's it's the purpose, not the burden. Um, the, what if we were able to take that identity and say, all right, we, there's some certain fields in there that we want public, and then all the other fields you keep down. So for your, your um, personal identity on this motive network, um, no name, uh, male, um, maybe ethnicity, maybe, you know, like, like some uh, census data. Um, who all do you live with? How or how many people? You know what are? Do you live with? Uh, okay, I live with three sisters and a wife and and our brother-in-law and this whatever it is. All, all that kind of big data, metadata. Put that out there and let that be searchable. Mm. Um, and medical conditions related to those things, but nothing that drills it back to you as an individual, so that you have a live census. Well, a census that happens every ten minutes that gives you a million times the information the census happens now, and you're able to real-time track everything that's, all the problems that are going on. Is there, a, like I remember, I was involved in one project, or the University of Montana had this um, big metadata aggregation thing where they were looking at, there was a problem with leukemia or something like that in this rural area of Pennsylvania. Like, what in the world? All this leukemia, and it was huge rates, really bad, of ages where people shouldn't be getting it. And they used this metadata of gathering all this stuff for around, and they figured out it's the cheese makers aren't gassing off whatever chemicals come out of the cheese that do that. They, they had them gas it off way higher, and these counts went down. Well, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of mega trends like that that you can get through big data we don't have to give our information up for them to have that value. That's always what the big companies will say is like, yeah, I know we have control over so much. I promise we'll do good things with it. But it has to be that way to have this convenience or to have this metadata value. Actually, it doesn't. It can be completely verifiable and you can strip any identity out of it. So your country will know, your region of the world will know when you have a uh, you know, a medical thing that's popping up that doesn't make sense and they can look into. They won't know that you know. They won't know that it's you. you. They will know that there's a case. Right. Okay. And it might be like, all right, man, it's a case of guys, you know, middle-aged uh, white guys, um, yeah. especially if they breathed in a lot of gunpowder. They're this and that. Okay, well, all right, I should pay attention. Um, the, but those kind of things, it comes down to the real value is the, the ownership of it. No. Everything else we can already do. That's, that's, that's easy part. But you have to give up the ownership. And I think that's a big struggle for so many people with the, the, the social media platforms. Yeah, I want to be able to see what's going on. I don't want them to see what, you know, they, I already, I realize they have too much of me already. So I'm not going to do it. Well, decentralize it? Okay. Now, now I'm back to being interested. Um, but as far as like these kind of values, my identity, my bank account, my medical records. Uh, why don't you stay out of those? There's a new tool where I don't have to give up. I don't have to leave that convenience away and I don't have to leave this away. And like these people are finding, they still don't have, our people still don't have access to the banks down there. They really don't need to. There's nothing they need out of a bank. No. When it comes to doing a loan, uh, we're growing our organizations and all, eventually banks will give loans in that. But if you don't have an identity and you don't have um, uh, a bank to, to trust you. How do they trust you if they can't ever track you? I mean, yeah. you'd never loan somebody like that money. Um, now that is possible um, without giving it away to the, to the masses to control you. Interesting. Um, so, sorry, I jumped way away from what motive. But anyway, that's so 
what our what our mission is um, is to empower those that have been disempowered, especially by society's systems. And and I don't think it was nefarious. Hmm. I think it's just the way it happens when it, human nature gets involved. And I think capitalism is very human nature. We 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 want to look out for ourselves. Capitalism does a lot of that. Um, and we create these systems that are really efficient, really good at making money. I, I like listening to that show about uh, social, the social dilemma. Um, and you you see those executives and designers and whatnot from big social media platforms going like, hey, we didn't mean for this tool to do what it's doing right now. We meant for it to do this, which also lets it do that. I get it. Technology is going to be that way. I think AI, you said you were looking for somebody on AI. I am yeah. looking for somebody on AI. Yeah, if I see anyone, I'll tell you, because that is, that's, it's unstoppable. It's got really scary ramifications. Yeah. It goes wrong. Um, blockchain doesn't. Well, where do people find you? So, um, our website is motive.ngo, like non-governmental organization. M-O-T-I-V. We never put the E on. Just kind of bullshit hanging out on the end. There's no reason for that E on there. <laughs> we also thought we'd be really slick and be like, that's a cool way. No one will have this. Yeah, it's spelled that way more than it is with the E. So we were not slick and cool. Um, but the uh, also on our all our social media, um, you know, Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram. I think our YouTube thing is done, but we don't have much content there. It's um, Motive NGO Global. Okay. So at Motive NGO Global on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever. Um, we are we're really just right now launching our public awareness. We've been completely under wraps. Um, there's about 30 people um, within the organization uh, working really hard, plus me. Um, I don't I don't work all that hard, um, but it it just continues to blossom and and expand and grow and. Um, we want, want people to watch. Um, certainly turn our, our social media numbers up. Um, we don't have anything to sell you. Um, you can donate to us now through our website, but we don't have our tax exempt letter returned from the IRS, expecting that any day. So I can't promise that it will be tax uh, refundable, but um, we anticipate that will come soon. Um, if you are a lot of people ask like, okay, well, I want to go down. There's not a ton for you to do. So we don't, I don't have any trips planned to like, okay, we're going to go down there and let you watch phones transact, you know. But if you come down to Peru, um, we'd be happy to take you through um, our hubs, um, some pretty cool ones, um, show you around, show you the classes, the schools, uh, let you buy from all of our cool entrepreneurs. I think how many graduates we've had. I think over 350 graduates of entrepreneur school that are running little businesses and stuff. Well, I'll link all your information below and when you guys get the 503, 501c3 stamp of approval, then let me know that too and I'll put that down in the description as well. Cool. So, but hey Rich, I just really appreciate you coming all the way out here and uh, educating us on your nonprofit and a little bit about blockchain, Bitcoin, so. Oh, thanks for the opportunity. Now, anytime, any great things happen down there, you're able to go like, you know what, I was a part of that. I, I promoted that, I got that broadcast, and take that to heart. If, if and when you hear stuff about us, go like, yeah, no, I did. I, I will. Did some of that. So, I thank will. Thank you so It'll much. It'll be interesting to see how it all comes together. Yep, yep. But, all right. Have a safe trip home. All right, right, will do. Cheers. Thanks so much. Appreciate it.